for those of you who don't know me, my name is Martin Letts. I'm the Deputy Director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy. And today uh, is a second of what I hope we will develop as a series of um, Australian conversations on the vexed public policy question of nuclear power and nuclear expertise. Historically, most Australians have not felt comfortable with nuclear power. They believe Australia has plenty of other sources of energy to draw on and that the risks associated with the safety and security of nuclear power should be too great. But as Dan pointed out in his um, In the Ages poll, which also corresponds very closely to other polls taken in Australia, uh, by the end of last year, by October 2010, there was a discernible shift in Australian public opinion towards considering nuclear power as an important viable uh, energy source in, in the context of concerns about climate change and carbon emissions, in the context of our voracious energy needs and those growing voracious energy needs of the globe. And uh, even though Australians were still very much focused on renewables, and it was 80% support for development of renewables, there was a 49% uh, shifting towards half of Australians who actually believed that nuclear power was an important energy option for Australia. Uh, interestingly, by the way, in the Australian mindset now also, the question of nuclear power is now quite separate from exports of uranium. There is a solid majority of Australians who actually support Australia exporting uranium to other countries, but uh, not the same sort of support for actually taking that the West, which is another next question. Post Fukushima, uh, polling uh, showed a, perhaps a, de a default back to our positions. Uh, the Lowy Institute poll, some of you may have heard about the Lowy polling, we do one every year, uh, and uh, that is going to be published at the end of the month, but I can, I think I'm not giving away too much by telling you that Lowy polling on this matter has confirmed uh, a trend back towards around 35% of Australians supporting nuclear power, uh, with uh, the, the remainder are very much, very strongly opposed or somewhat opposed to nuclear power. And yet as a proven technology for base slow power, in particular with a small carbon footprint, nuclear energy still has no rivals as an attractive source of clean and comparatively safe energy. Uh, this is especially true for our own backyard. Uh, we view this question very much in the context of Australia's position in the world's most dynamic economic region. Uh, geostrategic weight is shifting to the Asia-Pacific region and there are many countries in our own region, uh, and, and I'm not just speaking about China, uh, but also in Southeast Asia, who have definite plans for nuclear energy and whose energy, nuclear energy expertise is going to outstrip ours um, within the next decade if we don't do something about this. The debate in Australia has uh, in the past been very much divided between those who are rapidly pro or rapidly against. Um, as the Lowy Institute, we're very concerned about the fact that this is a discussion that is never really a discussion, it's an argument. And what we are aiming to do is to bring new voices into this debate. Uh, new voices who are not known for the positions that they've taken. I'm a great admirer of Ziggy Spitkowski, and he is an extremely articulate advocate for nuclear power, but he is very much a lone voice, and it would be good, uh, I think, to bring other voices in, and also those who have uh, concerns or problems or scepticisms um, tend to have rather fixed positions, and it would be good to really find a little bit that middle ground and people with experience. What was very really interesting about the Fukushima incident, um, apart from the fact that uh, the accident was obviously a very grave one, was that we did finally see emerge a, a number of new voices in Australia, some, real, some people with expertise and background who finally uh, were engaged in this discussion. And I believe in post-Fukushima, the Australian public is already better informed about the technology and the risks uh, than it was before the Fukushima incident. And, uh, that can only, um, and that can only be a good sign uh, for, for, for the debate uh, in this country. Uh, at the Institute, we ran our first panel with industry representatives in Sydney on the 20th of April. If you're interested, you can listen to the podcast on our website. And, uh, and, we, and today, we're talking to some people who have experience in understanding how community attitudes are shaped towards the nuclear power and what the main issues are. In, in our further discussion. In the future, the Institute also wants to um, have a panel with uh, resource experts to talk about the economics of nuclear power, because that is also a, a, an open question, open for debate in terms of whether, uh, even if it was safe and secure, uh, whether it is something that is financially viable. 
and, uh, and then also um, host a panel discussion with some people who are actually involved in the technology and the science of, of nuclear power. So this is very much, uh, uh, as I say, an effort to bring in new voices into the debate, and we hope to be able to continue this over the next 12 months. Uh, we've got a terrific panel today, and I don't want to take up more, too much more of their airtime, so uh, I will now uh, introduce them. What we'll do is we'll um, ask our panellists to say, to talk about five to ten minutes, uh, and, uh, uh, and then we will open it for discussion, and we will close proceedings at two o'clock. And before um, I hand over to our panel, or while I'm introducing our panel, I just think that this is a very interesting slide uh, in 2007 that we should put, bear, put in the back bear in mind when we talk about this question. Uh, uh, it's interesting, for example, that um, in Australia in particular, we're talking about uh, how, how we deal with climate change uh, quite in a quite parallel process with energy policy. That's a, that's a problem, I think, in public policy in this country. But the other thing we need to bear in mind is uh, the fact that even in countries which are relatively more advanced in, for example, utilization of other energy sources and renewables, uh, there is a very low inclination to pay any extra or much extra uh, to, to, to solve global warming. So these are some hard facts uh, those, those statistics haven't changed a great deal, um, uh, certainly um, in the polling that's done in Australia and elsewhere. So it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a quite an impactful slide about understanding uh, how much people are actually prepared to pay extra to solve a problem that everyone seems to think is uh, the, one, the great problem of our times. Our panel today, uh, our first speaker will be Andy Lloyd, the Chief Development Officer of Uranium Rio Tinto, who's going to talk a little bit more about, about the industry and the economics of nuclear power. Warren Mundine, the Chair of the Australian Indigenous Chamber of Commerce and Chair and Founding Member of the Indigenous Dialogue Group of the Australian Uranium Association, uh, will uh, share some thoughts with us today about um, his dialogue process, but also about his personal journey on this particular question. And finally, Dan Professor Daniela Stelic, who's done a fascinating study um, of um, which she did with, 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 uh, with the National Academies Forum, uh, a 2009 report on nuclear attitudes in Australia. I commend it to you as absolutely fascinating reading, and she's going to talk a little bit about how community attitudes are shaped towards this uh, issue of great public policy importance. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Andrew Lloyd. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Martine, and thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, my role in Rio Tinto is around uranium, but I've come also with a coal background uh, and also had previously worked in the aluminium and copper parts of the business. So I bring a, 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 a multi-commodity view, but with the Rio Tinto flavour. Um, I want to start by acknowledging uh, the accident at Fukushima, which I think it is... Uh, um, the big issue in the room, particularly from the industry's point of view, uh, and again convey our condolences to the Japanese people. Um, the, the earthquake and tsunami resulted in over 25,000 people dead or missing, a truly calamitous disaster. In terms of the reactor itself at Daiichi Power Station, um, uh, the surrounding region has been severely impacted with evacuations over 100,000 people. Um, the, the Earthquake itself triggered an automatic shutdown, as would be expected for a nuclear power station. Um, and it was in the process of this shutdown that uh, the tsunami then hit, uh, debilitating the, the cooling systems in particular, and causing uh, many of the systems to be rendered um, inoperative. Um, Daiichi was an old power station. It was built in 1971 and in 1974. Um, so it was before the Three Mile Island incident. Um, the the uh, second generation reactor and, and uh, so of course now 40 years old. Uh, you can see the photograph of the site with the uh, units one to four on the left hand side and five and six on the right hand side. Um, units one to four are irreparably damaged um, but of course uh, the measures con uh, to control the reaction are still ongoing. Um, the emissions uh, have uh, um, not been as bad as you might have expected given the scale of the disaster, but nevertheless have been severe um, and on, are ongoing. So 
by no means can we say we know uh, what went on or have learnt the lessons yet. Um, there are numerous inquiries undergoing uh, underway um, and we will need to pay great attention to those inquiries including the Japanese ones but also the International Atomic Energy Agency who had a team there just uh, last week. Um, so there's much to learn, um, but it is clear that there were major design issues in, in the plant in terms of the, the design not being adequate to the, uh, the scale of this event and, and the risk. And we should be questioning also the risk assessment processes that surrounded the plant and the, and the oversight of the plant. Um, and when we learn those lessons, we will need to apply them and apply them quickly. The case today I will put to you is, is that uh, once we have learnt these lessons, we should remain open to revisiting the nuclear option. The two major topics I want to cover then uh, are uh, um, carbon emissions um, and nuclear's uh, comparative performance in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, and then secondly, I want to talk about cost. Um, we live in an age where there is rapidly increasing energy demand and concern over energy security. This is a global trend, but it's well illustrated by China, where in, in 2010, the electricity consumption, the demand for electricity, grew by 15%. So, presently, the world is growing quickly in terms of its power demand, more quickly than it is growing in terms of its economy. Uh, and at the same time, we have the challenge to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And we certainly accept the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's in this debate vital that we rely upon objective data and sound debate to inform our arguments. This subject is too important to play adversarial games. Um, and it's important that we recognise the uncertainty, but start now to address the energy issues that are confronting us. Uh, this chart shows the relative carbon emissions from the various power sources uh, and uh, I apologise that it doesn't include brown coal which for a Victorian audience uh, is important but brown coal would be on the left um, of this chart uh, at the, uh, the one tonne of CO2 per megawatt hour. Um, coal is the left hand side but supercritical and integrated gas, uh, gasification combined cycle. Um, so coal, uh, more than double the emissions that come from natural gas. Um, carbon capture and storage is the central column, uh, if that is successful in the long term, and, and that's, uh, I'll come back to the areas of that. And on the left hand side we have renewables, um, which clearly you can see very low emissions, and then nuclear. And nuclear ranks with the, the renewables in terms of overall life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a prime reason. Um, not the only reason, but a prime reason why we cannot afford to let nuclear slip from our energy mix. Turning to the cost and, and, and cost um, data is a vexed subject uh, in this uh, area and I've used the Electric Power Research Institute from the US um, because that is the premium uh, peer-reviewed source of cost data. On this chart we have a, a levelised cost of electricity in Australian dollars per megawatt hour. And you can see the existing power station stock uh, is the red line across the bottom. Um, and then the various energy sources with the base load uh, power sources on the left hand side <coughs> and intermittent sources uh, being wind and solar on the right hand side. And as you can see, there is an enormous spread in the costs, um, uh, and these costs are the cost uh, level, uh, you know, the, uh, the break-even cost of a new, a new power station. So, compared to today's power station, all the options are going to cost more. This is the first takeaway we should take from this slide. Um, and paying more for power is going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us all because. The cost of power is at the, cent the heart of our economic performance. Um, it's at the heart of the economy and our well-being. It impacts not only our own pockets, but also industry in many aspects of the performance of our economy. And at the same time, energy inputs have risen in line with international market pricing and concern internationally around it, the security of supply. 
So let's turn a little bit to how these uh, relativities matter, and in particular, let's start by increasing and uh, applying a $20 a tonne carbon price, which will lift the, the base cost of existing power stations and, and immediately start to see natural gas, natural gas comes into its own and the, the more intensive coal uh, on the left hand side starting to move up the, the, in terms of cost. But a $20 a tonne carbon price doesn't change the fundamental relativities very much at all. Um, and so from that point of view it will have a relatively small effect um, but it will actually change our economics and it will be a concern in terms of our competitiveness of, of our economy <coughs> and, and in particular for those parts of the economy that are seeking to export that, that will not have this charge applied. It's turned to $150 a tonne carbon price and it sounds like uh, a big number and certainly is in terms of its effects but that's what it will take for um, the other alternatives to really to come into contention other than uh, gas and wind which clearly are going to gain enormously. Um, at $150 per tonne we hope that that's a fair while away in terms of, of the time it will take for our economy to adjust because today it would be absolutely devastating. But at $150 a tonne we start to see that nuclear is coming to a similar level as to black coal in terms of its uh, cost of, uh, of uh, power generation. Um, and um, the solar is, uh, is also um, coming into contention but based on, on, uh, on today's type numbers. We are talking, however, about long life assets. We're talking about well into the future and we need to be thinking 25 years ahead. So there will be, on top of these trends, cost reductions that come over time. This is the, the curve for the reduction in solar, in solar voltaic, photovoltaic uh, uh, cells. And it shows very clearly on what is a logarithmic scale on the left hand side, the consistent downward trend uh, that is typical for new technologies as they are introduced. And, and so we should be anticipating that, that the newer technologies in particular, those that have development pathways will come down in cost. So as we think about planning for our longer term future, we need to think about where will these uh, various uh, op fuel options end up and certainly on the right hand side, solar voltaic it has a, a strong pathway downwards. We can expect it will become uh, competitive also. Um, the wind will continue to improve and also move down. So clearly wind and gas have a great future. But we also need to have a balanced energy mix. And we need to be balancing our uh, baseload power with our intermittent sources. We need to make sure that we are reducing our overall greenhouse gas emissions um, within a competitive economy. And so nuclear is an option here economically that will come into its own in time. So to quickly draw a couple of conclusions. Um, and uh, the first is that, that energy demand is heading upwards and therefore our greenhouse gas emissions are heading upwards. We are, we are heading in the wrong direction in terms of, of uh, climate change and the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But we need to make a start in addressing it. The scale of the transition that we are talking about over the next 25 and onwards, uh, 25 years and onwards, is enormous and I don't think it's well understood. The, the investment that is required is enormous and so this will be a very big transition that is going to take time and it's going to take a significant investment. A small carbon price is a logical first step but, but our competitiveness as a nation is also a real issue that needs to be balanced and that's why it makes sense to have an independent umpire as part of this process to monitor that process. Technology improvements need to be delivered for all forms of low emission energy. And we are talking about a high degree of uncertainty. Nuclear is the lowest cost base load power option and it will become increasingly important in the longer term um, and in the medium term. But for now, we need to learn the lessons of Fukushima. We should start to educate our future nuclear engineers and build capability so that in 10 years time, when we have to make a decision and the information is far clearer, 
we're in a position to be able to take that decision if we need to. So I'm not advocating nuclear today or a decision to go nuclear today. I am advocating that we build the foundation to be able to say yes at some point in the future. Thanks very much, Andy. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of a, bit of a layman's uh, approach to this whole matter because I'm not going to pretend I'm a uh, nuclear physicist because I'm not. Just in fact, my background is mainly in native title and land rights as well as you know, in my work, the natural gas and pipeline construction area. So that's where I come from. It's an interesting journey as a layman going from, you would ask me to come up and speak here seven years ago, even six years ago, I probably would have been standing at the door shouting at you, saying no to nuclear, no to uranium mining. So it's been an interesting shift in where I'm going in regard to this whole event. Uh, I also want to raise the uh, events in Japan as well, and, and they, they were shocking and they were tragic on the scale that it was, and they've probably got images in my mind in regard to the tsunami and watching that wave continuously cross the country and the tragedy that goes out, that happened there, so my heart goes out to the, the people who were affected in Japan. Uh, but the current, to me, but the current problems at uh, Fukushima uh, reactors show why Australia needs to be more not less, involved in the global nuclear energy sector. Uh, to me, nuclear science is just that, it's science. When Australians make decisions about the future of its nuclear industry, we need to make it based on evidence and facts. Uh, you know, one of the big shifts, and, and, and as um, uh, Martin introduced me, I was, uh, I still am, uh, uh, the co-convener of the Indigenous Dialogue Group of the Australian Uranium Association. The association just did some po polling post uh, Fukushima, <clears throat> which was looking at the, in May, this year, mid-May, looking at that, and it did comparisons in regard to 2007 and 2000, uh, November 2010, where the whole uh, process was going. There's no doubt that in people's minds in Australia, there was a shift moving towards nuclear power, and there was a shift uh, mainly because in the, in the boundaries of the climate change issues. If we're going to move, uh, because people are very supportive and, uh, uh, and of what is uh, of climate change, so it's it's about that that uh, boundaries that things are operating in. Of course, post uh, 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 Fukushima, that polling has gone back, but it actually surprised us with the, uh, the people within the Australian range that, that it wasn't as bad as what we thought it'd be. That we thought it'd be a total collapse. It's that numbers that that will, we see will be rising again. And it is mainly within this climate change debate and this energy sector debate that, we, that, that pe people are putting this whole discussion in. For me, my journey from anti-nuclear to nuclear happened about seven years ago, eight years ago. Uh, and I'm of the generation that uh, was brought up in the 1950s and 1960s uh, horror movies of nuclear holocaust and how the world was all gonna end uh, through the Cold War and all those movies about uh, deformities and all that other stuff that was going on. Uh, it was from, a, from an interesting angle. Mine was through uh, um, nuclear science, uh, nuclear medicine. It was uh, through uh, my wife who received cancer and had uh, breast cancer at the time and through that process of um, uh, radiation therapy that she had to receive. Uh, and that's what changed my, started changing my view about this whole process that, you know, here was radiation, here was nuclear medicine that was saving her life and many other Australians' lives around the country. So then I started look, investigating my stance and I found out that 90% of my stance on anti-nuclear was more emotion than actual fact. And I needed to start looking about the facts and start looking at the whole industry as a whole. At the same time, there was another job that I had, I was elected national president of the Australian Labor Party and within 24 hours of getting that job, uh, uh, the current minister, Martin Ferguson, dropped me in the poos by coming out and saying, we're going to now change the free minds policy. Uh, and I, I remember sitting at home saying, thank you very much, uh, uh, Martin, I thought I was going to have an uh, uncontroversial presidency. 
we sat down and we investigated that approach and we found that it was an illogical policy that the Labor Party had at the time, uh, having restriction to free mines, and in actual fact we are one of the major exporters of uranium in the world. So it was very much a hard work and hard slog to change that policy, we did, and then we started looking at a number of other areas, we started looking about the nuclear science, we started looking at the energy sources that we needed to do to start going into the future. I believe Australia is in a very unique situation in that we are a major exporter of uranium. We are a, um, uh, and we'll continue to do that. We have a large deposit of uh, productive uranium in our country. We need to pay, we just cannot uh, dig uranium up and export it overseas. Uh, we need to play a global role. We need to play a global role in the whole energy uh, sector and also in the non-proliferation sector. It's an important role that we need to play. Uh, we are doing that as a, as a nation and we need to drive forward into the future. What we must start doing now is dispel a lot of the nonsense and a lot of the emotions that are in this debate and actually start getting back to the hard facts and start looking at the hard science about where we're going to be in the future. Uh, as Andy spoke about, our energy needs and our energy demands are going up. Uh, Despite people thinking that our population is going to, they need to stop the growth of our population is going to grow. We're looking at hundreds of thousands of workers we need in skills at the moment to bring into the country to move us forward. And we've got to deal with this whole issue of energy and how we're going to be a player in this area. And if we are serious about climate change and we are serious about emissions, then we need to be looking at uh, nuclear energy, nuclear power. As we see from the chart, it is a very low emissions um, uh, producer. So let's take up the challenge, let's discuss this, let's start looking to the future. Uh, there's no doubt that Fukushima has slowed the process down. Uh, it has not stopped the process, it needs to go forward again. I think it's probably going to take us a few years to get this day from about 10 years. But it's a, a thing, and I do agree with Andy, it's a thing that uh, the, the, the uranium industry, uh, nuclear industry, has to answer some questions. Um, and I am very confident they will learn the lessons of Fukushima, as they will learn the lessons as they did in the past, with, with a number of other things like Chernobyl and that, and they've made the industry safe. In fact, it's one of the safest industries in the world compared to other industries, a lot of other industries. And it's about building the future uh, for a, for our nation as a competitor in the global market. As, as a famous actress uh, said this week why she was involved in, in a debate on TV, that she had children. I have children too, and I have grandchildren as well. And we need to build a safer world from them. I think we need to get away from these uh, slogans and cute one-liner debates, start looking at the evidence, start looking at the science, and start learning the lessons and building our future for us. It's important for Australia to be part of the, uh, whether we like it or not, we are in the uranium industry. Uh, we have to be constructive in that. We have to work together with that, with other countries around the world and within the industry. And we need to build a, few, a, a strong, solid industry for us. I've, um, I've, the te technology advances, the innovation that is happening with the next round of uh, nuclear power stations is something that we need to talk about and that will, people will be surprised about how the safety and other issues are being met and how the industry will be moving forward. There are other things that we also must face, whether we like it or not, and this is about a nuclear waste repository. Uh, whether people like, that, like it or not, we have that waste in Australia now. We must be uh, sensible. We must approach, again, approach that with a sensible discussion, not just say no. It's about how we do these things and how we do and how we move forward as a strong, constructive uh, contributor and a good global citizen in this area. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I welcome questions and, and challenges, and uh, I look forward to the debate moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, uh, That's a nice segue, Daniela, into your presentation about what it is that influences Australians on this subject. Daniela. Thank you very much, Martine, and thank you to the Lowy and also to the AHE for the opportunity. Um, the work that I'm reporting on today was commissioned by the National Academies Forum, and it was undertaken in 2009, finished in 2010. 
And the project actually timed, uh, coincided with increased attention to climate change, global warming, and uh, challenges associated with new energy technologies as we were leading up to what uh, the world thought was a major milestone out of Copenhagen. The um, questions that we asked uh, as part of the study were not so much what do Australians think, because as Martine's mentioned and also I think um, uh, Warren has, there's polling done all the time on what Australians think. What the Academy was mostly interested in was how is the debate shaped, um, what are the historical and contemporary formations of attitudes to nuclear power, how can we look at the international um, scene and compare that to the Australian context and how are the debates likely to be shaped in the future. So the study wasn't a national survey, it was a look at the way in which attitudes to this particular uh, technology are shaped. And the way in which um, it emerged over the nine months that we tracked th that debate was that it kind of confirmed our uh, the hypothesis that was developed that attitude formation is linked very much to our social environment and it's also linked to the influence of opinion leaders and that in that um, shaping of attitudes we can consider the debate about nuclear energy as being a form of performance where there are a number of actors and who come on the stage and say their part and in the nine months of the study, which actually included um, the visit to Australia by uh, ex-Vice President Al Gore, it was, it was fascinating to see just how that performance was being played out. Common sense tells us that attitudes to new technologies don't leap fully formed into our collective consciousness. They have a past and they're constantly being shaped and reshaped. And what we can think about in this way is um, uh, the um, classic kind of diffusion technology, which is that new technology acts as a kind of wave through society. Um, the internet is a classic example. There are the early adopters, um, then there's a pause, and then um, the largely the majority take it up, and then finally there are uh, laggards, um, people who uh, eschew the technology, whatever it might be. So uh, this research took that idea of diffusion a step further and considered the role of opinion leaders and how the opinion leaders ride this way, if you like, of diffusion. And particularly how the opinion leaders then are themselves components of what uh, the research called epistemic communities, that is, that they speak to others like themselves. Um, they have this, these communities have shared sets of normative and principled beliefs and they have a kind of shared common purpose. And individuals who share such characteristics, so in the broader population, then adjust their own opinions according to the basis of the perceived quality of what's coming to them in terms of the uh, information that they're receiving. So uh, the sharing of information, the role of opinion leaders, and um, how that was all being played out was uh, undertaken through two particular case studies that um, I analysed in, in detail. The first was the period of 0607, which was a heightened time of interest, uh, largely around what is technically called the Umpner uh, Review, but often commonly referred to it as the Swiatkowski Review. And um, if you have a look at the polling taken at that time, there is a peak, and that's because there was this heightened uh, performance around it. And the second, as I mentioned in 2009, which was a gift, to me, because I didn't know uh, this was going to happen when I started the study, was the visit by US President, um, Vice President Al Gore, and the whole lead up and, and excitement and um, sort of heightened sense of drama around climate change in Copenhagen. So the study, very briefly then, uh, came up with six pathways that uh, Australians use to form their attitudes. Historical, cultural, political, uh, not surprisingly, things are in the age, news media, international and educational. And um, specific findings on attitudes included that the measurement of them remains essentially problematic because what we normally measure is opinion. Attitude is actually when behaviour changes. Opinion is just what we think. Um, and they're very, very highly dependent. Attitudes are highly dependent on salience which just means that the issue has to be front and centre in our lives. 
And um, as we've seen from the various slides, etc., we're so dependent on other forms of technology that it actually isn't salient to us to consider nuclear power. We also found that formation is a very long and complex process and has both gender and intergenerational differences. And this is really very important when you have a look at um, various polling to see uh, the, the sharp difference between the way men and women think about these issues and also the age ranges of people and how they also think. And finally and importantly, um, attitude formation draws on individual belief systems. So it's about how we feel about the world and they operate in moral and political domains. So this really explains why nuclear power continues to provide an example of essentially polarised attitudes. Thank you very much.